I'm going to go through a couple observations on the place and then how that, how that fits in our lives as Christians and then what that, what that means for us uh, today and tomorrow. Um, so Gilgal, starting with this observation, is, is, is the, the starting place in the narrative of Joshua from which all the movement of the people of God go and come. And, and everything that God does through the promised land as, as they're inheriting the place stems out of Gilgal. So if you turn to chapter 4, look at verse 19. It says the people, this is right after they crossed uh, the Jordan, right? They, they, they crossed, they, God told them to gather some stones, and they brought those stones to this place where they encamped, Gilgal. Um, and the people came out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they camped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? And you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. And that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So Gilgal is a place that represents the gracious provision of the Lord for Israel. His, his mighty hand that rescued them. And in Gilgal, God started as they come and encamp there for the first time. The first thing that he wanted them to do was set up a memorial to him. Something that, that reminds the people constantly of what God has done in the past. So this is there for the generations to know, for you to know, that I am the one who dried up the river and brought you across on dry land. I'm the one who opened up the impassable sea and brought you through. I'm the one who's done that. And I am your God, I am mighty, and I can be trusted. Not only is Gilgal a place that represents the gracious prep, uh, provision of the Lord, and the place where he provided a memorial of his work, but it's also the place where God removed the last vestiges of unbelieving Israel. We talked about this if you watched the sermon in, I don't know when this is, April or so, uh, Mother's, Mother's Day, May. Yeah, I, always, I will always remember this, speaking on circumcision on Mother's Day. Uh, not necessarily <laughs> the best sermon to go to, but that's what the Lord had. So, uh, But in that sermon, we saw that when, when the people were called to circumcise themselves, they were removing the evidence, the last part of the evidence of the unbelieving people of the wilderness, right? So circumcision is something that God calls his people to do to the next generation. And in the circumcision is a, re a revelation of the, of the faith of the previous generation. Does that make sense? An eight-day-old eight eight baby does not circumcise himself. It has no volitional choice in the matter. Doesn't you know? If he did, he'd probably say no. Uh, it's the father and the mother who say, "Lord, this is what you want us to do, and so we will do this." And they they circumcise their children. And throughout the forty years of wandering, not a single one of the generation that was crossed the Red Sea that disobeyed the Lord that that failed to believe and to trust that he was able to defeat the giants in the land and the strongholds that were there. And in your discipline where the Lord said, I, I will cause you to wander and you will die out and I will bring a new generation in. In all that, the representation of their unbelief, the last bit of it is seen in the people. And so, in verse five, or chapter 5, verse 8, um, it says for Starting in verse 7, it says, So it was their children who he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And so the, the people there were now trusting wholly in the Lord, in the faithful provision of the Lord, whose mighty hand and outstretched arm rescued them from their enemy, and by faith circumcising themselves and their children, and removing the evidence of this previous unfaithful, uh, unbelieving generation from them. Not only did that happen there, but it, God pr protected them in the process. We talked about this on that Mother's Day sermon, that 
you, you become pretty vulnerable when you're in that kind of position as a man, especially if you're a, an older man. Uh, it's, it's a couple weeks probably of, of, of healing before you're able to attack. And in doing so, if the enemies around you, if any territory we're in, were to hear this, this, was, this was happening, they have an easy way to come and defeat this horde of people who just came across. The Lord protected them. I mean, this is this is what uh, what the sons of Joshua, or the sons of uh, of Jacob did, uh, because their their sister um, was taken advantage of by one of the sons of Shechem. I mean, you know that Genesis. And they they say you know kind of deceive deceive them. Say we'll we'll give you our sister if you do this one thing and you circumcise all the male in your in your in your city. And then when they did that, when they were sore, they came in and they just decimated. And so the people should have known this story, and even, even in doing it, they're trusting the Lord for his provision and his protection, and the Lord protected them in it. So not only is, is that happening, um, but the Lord is removing his discipline from the people of Israel. He's bringing them into the promised land. He's establishing them and giving them an encampment in this land that he promised Abraham. Years and years and years ago, this is, this is the first entrance into the land and not only is the first entrance in the land, the Lord is allowing them to begin to experience the fruit of the land. So um, in chapter 5, verse 10, we see this first Passover, which is really the first Passover celebrated um, since they left Egypt. Um, and, um, and in that, it says, verse 12, the manna ceased the day that they ate of the produce of the land. There was no longer manna for them, the people of Israel, but they ate the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. And so God ceased this, this miraculous provision of manna, and then he gave, he gave them a taste of what was theirs, a taste of, of, of first fruits, of, of the inheritance and the blessing that God has given them in Gilgal. And then the Lord appeared to Joshua, chapter 5, verse, verse 13. Um, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him and said, What does my Lord say to his servant? To his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to, said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So God himself revealed himself to, to, to Joshua. Uh, and Paul had this, this sermon, this is, this is a pre-incarnate Christ showing up on the scene. Same thing that, that God did in the burning bush with Moses. And he revealed himself, I am with you, my army. I'm leading my army before you. I'm going to fight for you. I have provided for you. I have given you blessing. I've, I've removed away the reproach of the previous generation. I've removed away your reproach from you. i provided a place for you to sit secure and a place from which I want to go and to begin to break down the strongholds in this land. And so this, this place, Gilgal, is really it's the starting point of Israel's movement in the promised land. You see that? So not only is it the place where they move from in the in the promised land, but it's also the place they go from when they go up to Ebal and Gerizim. Uh, I think Paul had was on the talk to us, preached about this. It's Moses had commanded the people, once they count God in the land, to go to these two mountains. Um, if I had a PowerPoint, I could put a picture up there. They're just two mountains right across from each other. And they were go up to one and build an altar and go up to another one and they were to declare the blessings and the cursings from from these two uh, mountains. Um, in chapter 8, verse 30, if you want to turn there, this is where they do that. After defeating Ai, they go up there and they uh, Joshua renews the covenant. And at that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the, Lord, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel. As is written in the book of the law. Um, and there in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel, sojourner as well as native born, with their elders and officers 
and their judges stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Half of them in front of Mount Gerizim, and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded them at first to bless the people of Israel. And after reading afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There is not a word of all that Moses commanded Joshua that he did not read, read before all the assembly of Israel, and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. And so his call there, what, what Moses wanted the people do, to do, was once they were established in the land, they would go up to this place. They would re renew what God wanted them to wanted for them, how he wanted them to live. Blessed if you do this, cursed if you do this. Blessed if you do this, cursed if you do this. And it goes back and forth through, through all, all, all of what God desires for his people and how he desires them to live. And it's from this place, the place where God removed the reproach of Israel, where God with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, brought them in the stones that he, he set up to let them know how mighty he is in their life. The place where God gave them a first taste of the fruits of the promised land. From there, they go up and, and, they, and they, they speak out this blessing and cursing. And not only do, that, do they do that, but they go back to Gilgal. So after speaking the blessing and the cursing and, and what God desires for his people, how he desires them to live, they go back to the place where God removed their reproach, where God is mighty and strong, where God, God rescued them and revealed himself as the one who can save them. I don't know if you're tracking with me here, right? We're, when we're reading the blessings and the curses, there's not a single one of us who could do that, right? If I were to go back in Deuteronomy and read through that, I would take a lot of your time. Um, but if you were to go back on your own and read through that, and if you're honest with yourself, there is nothing in there that you are able to uphold for the rest of your life. All of us are transgressors of God's covenant. And even if we were to boil down the commands of God to the Ten Commandments, all of us, at some point, are murderers, as far as God's concerned. If you have harbor hate in your heart for your brother, you're a murderer. If you have a lustful thought, you're an adulterer. These are the standards that God gives. And if you are a person in Israel, you're sitting there and you're going, okay, I want to live this blessed life, but I really, if I'm, if I'm honest with myself, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to live it. But God takes his people after this and moves them back to the encampment where the stones are set up, where the hill of the foreskins is there, where God, where God provided for them a foretaste of what was to come. I rescued you. I removed the reproach. I'm the one fighting for you. I'm here. So not only is Gilgal a place where they go up and they read these blessings and cursings and they come back, it's also the place where Israel goes out on all their campaigns. So, in Gilgal, that's when Gideon came and they deceived, deceived them, and then they, you know, start this treaty. But it's from there where they, where, where Joshua goes on this this amazing day, this 20, 48 hour day, or however long it was, of of defeating most of the enemy strongholds in the south, where God came through and laid down hailstones that killed more people. That Israel killed with the sword. And God, God miraculously carried his people through the south and around, and they came back to Gilgal. So it's from the place where God is reminding his people where who he is and what he's done that they go out and with God conquer the, the strongholds of the enemy in in Israel. Right? It's from the place where God was, Joshua was led by the armies of the Lord to Jericho where the strongholds are broken. It's from, from that place they went up to Ai. It's from that place they go through the south. It's from that place they go up to the north and they destroy the north. It's, it's from Gilgal that, that Joshua's people move throughout the land. And it's also the place where Joshua returns 
after they're worn out from battle. So it's also the place that, it's not only the place where they go from the battle, it's also the place they return to when they're worn out from the battle. Just just decimated all these lands that we could, we could stop where we are, we can camp, no, we're going to go back to Gilgal. We see this in chapter 10, uh, two times actually, 10.15 and 10.43, if you're taking notes, 10.15 and 10.43. Uh, and Joshua captured all the kings of, uh, in their land at one time because the Lord of God of Israel fought for Israel. Then Joshua turned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilead. So Joshua, after he's exhausted, comes back to this place that reminds him of the strength and the power and the gracious work of God on, on behalf of Israel where there is a, a tower of stones sitting there symbolizing the miraculous movement of God on their behalf. And it's not only is that the case, but also Gilgal, chapter 14, verse 6, is a place where all of the inheritance is given out throughout the land. Uh, Gilgal is a place where Joshua gives out all the inheritance. We know this because um, Caleb's request. It says the people of Judah came up to Joshua at Gilgal, asking for their inheritance. So Joshua is, is, is encamped there. It's the first place they're there. It's the first place they experience the first fruits of, of what God is going to give them. And they're in their inheritance, it's the place where they come and they go up and they, they declare out the, the covenantal standard with which God wants them to live. It's the place they go back to after that's said. It's the place they go out from, from battle and back to when they're worn out. It's the, it's the place where the, where the inheritance comes from. And you look at that and you see that, that Gilgal stands at this, as a central place in the entire narrative of Joshua, from which all the movements of the people of, of God in the land go. It's a place where the reproach was rolled away. It's a place where, where, where victory came from. It's a place where the strength and the power to do what God commands, in a sense, comes from. And, and the writer of Joshua wants to make that explicitly clear to us. Because anything that the people of God do in the land that God is giving them that is stepped away from God's grace and His mercy and His steadfast love and His strength is going to fail. But if the people soak themselves and remind themselves and secure themselves in the gracious and loving God who rescued them out of bondage and brought them into new life, if they would remember that, that God would work mightily on their behalf. See, Gilgal is the place where the strength of the people, where their strength is reminded to them. It's a place where they remember where their strength actually comes from. And for the Christian, we have our own Gilgal. We have our own Gilgal. It's not a place. It's a person. The person is Jesus. He's the one who worked on our behalf. Who broke us out of bondage into death. And brought us into new life. He's the one who who separated the impassable sea of death, of our sin that makes us separate from a, a, a holy and righteous God. We, we can't mess this up. None of us deserve the grace of God. That's why it's called grace. Every single one of us is absolutely 100% broken if not for the grace of God in our life. Especially at a time like this when Christians all over the place are just complaining and, and convention is the, is the Yiddish word for complaining about, about what this, all these godless people in our society are doing. What the liberals are doing to our country. How 
could they? As if we were not susceptible to that same kind of position and thinking had it not been for God working mightily on their behalf. Those people are so selfish. They just want everything for nothing. Well, so do we. The amazing thing is that God gave us everything for nothing. Jesus is the one who removed our reproach. The last vestiges of that unbelieving generation, the last vestiges of my unbelieving heart, he removed. Jesus is the one who provides new life. And in him, through the Spirit, a taste, a foretaste of what's to come. He's the one who rolled our approach away. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You probably can, could speak this out of memory, and I hope that you can. If you can't, it's something to memorize. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Our reproach, our brokenness, because of Jesus, is taken away. You go to Romans, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's rolled our reproach away. He is our Gilgan. He's the one with whom we have the power to attack the enemy strongholds in our life. If you're in 2 Corinthians, I probably shouldn't close my Bible there. Go over to chapter 10. Verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but the divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take, take every thought captive to obey Christ, ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. It's, it's from Jesus that we have the place and the power to attack those strongholds of the enemy in our life and the lives of those around us. And he's the one when we return to, when we see the life that God calls us to is too much for us to do. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 20. Sorry, 19, 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Now, Paul's talking about sexual immorality in the church of, of Corinth. And he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God. Are you, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify your God in your body. We are not our own. We've been bought with a price. The Spirit of God dwells within us and He desires us to live in a way that honors and glorifies Him. And He doesn't leave us to do that by ourselves. He does that by placing Himself in us and giving us the, the, the power and the authority to do it. Right? Just like Israel going up to the blessings and the cursings and coming back and having to remind themselves that God is the one who rescued them. God is with them. God took the reproach away. God's going to empower them. He's going to be the one by faith to cause them to live the life of blessing if they'll trust Him. In the same way, God is the one who will empower us to live the life of blessing if they trust Him. He's the one whom we return to when we're worn out from the battle of the enemy. He's the one we go back to, back to the cross. Jesus, you love me. You're never going to leave me. You strengthen me. You're with me. I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
You know my every anxious thought. You're my strength when I am weak, is what the old song would say, which we're not singing today, but... Um, and he's the one who, with whom our inheritance is given. Turn to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 11. In him, Jesus, we have attained an inheritance, having been destined to, according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who are the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. We obtain an inheritance through Jesus. And just like Joshua was handing out the inheritance to the people of Israel at Gilgal, we receive our inheritance through Jesus. And the first fruits, the first tastes of that kingdom. He's the one through whom our entire story is written. Jesus is our Gilgal. Every aspect of our life as believers in this promised land. I, I, I mentioned this when we started the book of Joshua. It's a very good book at the look of the Christian life. We are called to go with God to break down the strongholds of sin in our life. Until he comes or brings us home. Hopefully he's coming soon. But if not, we still walk with him. We still strive with him. We still break down the anger and the lust and the and the gossip uh, and the and the distrust. All of that we break down by the power of the Spirit in our life, working with God, rooted and grounded in the fact that Jesus rolled away our approach, gave us new life, brought us out of death into life. Who's with us? has given us a spirit with us. It dwells in us. We are his. We are bought with a price. That price is the precious blood of Jesus. So with all this, I thought it was just a cool thing to see. In the Old Testament, just like Jesus has said, you search the scriptures and, and in them you see, you think you have eternal, because you in them you think you have eternal life. It is they that speak of me. You see the revelation of that in Joshua. Speaking of the Gilgal that was to come. The one who rolls the reproach away. And for us, that's who Jesus is. So because of that, this week, our life, every aspect of, of who we are, needs to be rooted and grounded in a constant reminder of who Christ is for. Just like Joshua and the people of Israel throughout the book are constantly reminded. Don't forget this. Every time they go to Gilgal, they see a pile of stones. And it's probably not a mountain. It's probably, you know, maybe this high or so. I don't know how big the boulders these guys carried out of the, out of the, out of the riverbed. But they see a pile of stones every time they come back to the camp. And they see a hill where everyone was circumcised. Every time they come back to that camp, it's just standing there constantly. And in the book, they're always going back to the camp, back to the camp, back to the camp. And for me, I read that, I see that, and I'm understanding that, and I start hearing my, my mind, abide in me and I with you. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Come back to me. Recognize me. Understand that I'm upholding you. I'm carrying you. I'm working with you. God is with you in every aspect of life. When you do the things that you're not proud of, He's still with you. All of us, all of us have things that we do that we wish people would not know about. And we spend our lives hiding them and trying to manage them and trying to keep them from other people knowing about them. And the crazy thing is we, we, we hide them thinking that we can keep them from the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God. Instead of taking hold of the truth that in Christ all of my reproach is taken away, that God is committed to me through Him, 
that his spirit is in me, and he wants me not to be, um, not to be condemned by the things that I do, but convicted, and a conviction that leads to repentance, and repentance that leads to confession, and confession that leads to trust in the fact that God, that Jesus' sacrifice was enough to cover even what I'm doing right now. And the trust that God, in his mercy and grace and his strength, is able to overcome that in my life. You serve a good and powerful God. He's bringing a gentle breeze in here at this time. A, a taste of, of his provision for us, right, in this hot and humid day. If it was still, we'd be like, okay, when is this guy going to stop talking? And I'm starting to sweat here and get back in the air conditioning. But he's bringing, at a human day, a gentle breeze across our face that's going across the little drops of sweat or glistening, depending on your gender. Um, <laughs> it's cooling us off. Because he loves us. So we trust him. So I'm going to leave you here with a verse that I found today. I, I haven't seen this before either. Um, not today, yesterday I found it. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. This is awesome. It says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Let me read that again. Let not the, the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let, let, let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I understand and know Jesus. He did what I could not do. He provided for me what I do not deserve. Because it's infinite and gracious love. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love and justice and righteousness on the earth. For in these things, knowing and understanding the Lord, I do like it. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for the depth of it. I thank you um, that you can be trusted. I thank you for this day to gather out on the lawn that you protected us from the rain and the heat, that you gave us a gentle wind, that the birds were singing, reminding us of creation who calls out to you. Lord, help us to remember who you are in our life. Help us to remember what you've done. Help us to remember that we're not alone and we're not forsaken. Help us to remember how great you are in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.